From the Missouri School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalists. I'm Jason McClure. Egypt will hold a presidential election at the end of this month, but there's little drama about who will actually win. President Abdel Fattah el-Sisi, who led a 2013 coup against the country's first democratically elected leader, is expected to be handily re-elected. That's because el-Sisi's government has arrested or intimidated all viable potential opponents. That's left him facing off against just one virtually unknown adversary, someone who is actually an outspoken supporter of the president until just hours before the candidate registration deadline. So while most observers view this election as a sham, it's not without drama. After el-Sisi's coup ended a brief experiment with democracy after the Arab Spring, the country has been going backwards in many ways. Its economy is stagnant, its population is growing rapidly, and there's virtually no place for people to express discontent. Opposition leaders have been jailed or exiled, and independent media has been tightly restricted. Meanwhile, the country faces a bloody Islamist insurgency in the Sinai Peninsula. Critics say things are even worse than under former President Hosni Mubarak, who was ousted by those street protests in 2011. So this has put the Trump administration and its Western allies in an awkward spot. Egypt has long been a key U.S. ally in the Middle East, where it's viewed as a bulwark of stability in a region beset by wars. But with el-Sisi's government looking brittle, that calculation may prove wrong. On this edition of Global Journalist, a look at Egypt's staged election, what it may mean for its future and its relationship with the U.S. Now, in a minute, we'll hear from three people who are tracking Egypt's campaign closely. First, we're going to bring in Michelle Dunn. She's a former Middle East specialist at the State Department who is now director of the Middle East program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Michelle, welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Well, just help us rewind briefly. Uh, many people remember those images of the Arab Spring in Tahrir Square in Cairo, where you had sort of pro-Mubarak regime security forces on camels sometimes charging into protesters trying to quell uh, this popular protest. So catch us up on Egyptian history since then. Well, you know, a as you've noted, so Egypt had this very brief and chaotic uh, opening an attempt at a democratic transition between 2011 when um, protesters rose up against you know President Husni Mubarak who'd been in power for 30 years and with the help of the military overthrew him um, and and then uh, 2013 when the military once again stepped in and overthrew the first democratically elected president Mohamed Morsi who was a very polarizing figure and who had become deeply unpopular. But what happened was, I think the protesters were asking for the removal of Morsi and maybe another another chance at a democratic election. What they got instead was a close down of the entire democratic transition and the military taking power more firmly and mo more overtly than they had been in power for a long time. So Abdel Fattah Sisi, the defense minister at the time, uh, took power and then got himself elected president in 2014. The moment that they're at right now is that his first mandate is up and he has to run for uh, re-election. But as you've noted already in the introduction, there this is nothing like a democratic election. There were some very interesting political maneuvering where no fewer than five serious people stood up and said they wanted to run against CC, and he managed to eliminate all of them and now is just running against a candidate whom no one takes seriously at all. Well, so I think what Egypt... I'm sorry, Michelle, I just, I wanted to ask you, especially about where U.S. policy has been in all of this, because Egypt, for years, was one of the largest recipients, uh, second largest recipient, I think, of U.S. foreign aid. Uh, so talk to us about what the Obama administration, what the Trump administration has, has done on this. You know, de dealing with Egypt, uh, a long time ally has become increasingly problematic for the United States over the last decade or so. This didn't just happen in the last couple of years. Uh, the United States has invested a lot in this relationship. We became Egypt's major ally in the late 1970s, and we are tens of billions of dollars of military and economic assistance, you know, invested in Egypt and in this relationship. But there's been this long-running difference between U.S. government officials, and it hasn't even mattered that much which administration and and Egyptian officials on basically how you know what what's how the country 
should be run in order to achieve stability and economic prosperity. Um, there were disagreements, a lot of disagreements between President George W. Bush and President Mubarak when he was in power, uh, between uh, President Obama and um, and and Mubarak, and then and then what came after Mubarak, Morsi, and now Sisi, and even President Trump. So where we are right now is that. Um, on the surface, President Trump has been much more friendly to President Sisi than President Obama was, right? And Correct he, me if I'm wrong. He, when President El Sisi came to the White House, Trump uh, called him a fantastic guy who was doing a fantastic job. Absolutely, and, and gave him the photo op, and then they met again in Saudi Arabia, and, um, you know, but... Behind the scenes, what's really interesting is that the Trump administration is exerting, in some ways, more pressure than Obama did. Uh, and this is partly driven by the Congress, that the, the U.S. Congress, which is the one that appropriates all this, all these billions of dollars in aid, is playing an increasingly assertive role. So what's happening right now is that um, the Trump administration is withholding uh, about 15 percent of the military aid from Egypt, saying it's not going to be released until Egypt meets certain conditions. I think we're going to speak to that more in just a few minutes. But one thing I wanted to ask you about is something that I know you've spoken out on in the past, and that is that a lot of U.S. assistance is military assistance, military hardware, uh, grants to purchase military equipment. And some of that equipment has been used in human rights abuses, in sort of crackdowns on insurgencies in Egypt. Tell, tell us what we know about that. Yeah, well, this is really problematic. So there's evidence and, and vi video and photographic evidence of several troubling things. And these are related to the Egyptian military campaign against the terrorist insurgency um, in the Sinai. It's also going on in other parts of the country, but the most intense part of it is in the Sinai. So, for example, video evidence emerged that um, Egyptian soldiers were carrying out extrajudicial killings, were actually um, capturing suspected terrorists, and then when there was an attack on Egyptian forces, pulling some of those people captured out of prison and staging their killings to make it look like, you know, killing them and, and staging it as though it was a, a raid that they carried out against the, the perpetrators of attacks. And they were doing this using U.S. equipment and using U.S. vehicles. More recently, there's a, another big... Um, offensive against the terrorist insurgency, although it looks a little bit like it's more for show uh, as CC faces this new uh, election and has to prove that he's acting seriously against terrorism. But it, 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 and it, it showed uh, Egyptian military lo um, loading cluster munitions onto aircraft. And these seem to be cluster munitions that Egypt may have obtained from the United States long ago, more than 10 years ago, before the United States stopped selling such things. Well, that, that uh, certainly seems quite quite problematic, especially since it's American tax dollars that are being used to, to fund some of these atrocities, essentially. But I'm sorry, Michelle, we're out of time. We're going to have to leave it there. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. You're welcome. A reminder that this is Global Journalist. On today's program, we're talking about the upcoming presidential election in Egypt, set for March 26th to the 28th, and what it means for a country where the military has reasserted control after the Arab Spring uprisings. To broaden our discussion, we're going to bring in three other guests. Joining us from London, Ontario, is Sarah Korshid. She's an Egyptian freelance journalist who has written for Foreign Policy, The New York Times, and The Huffington Post. In Bremen, Germany, we're joined by Jonathan Moremi. He's a longtime journalist who's written for a number of outlets, including Egypt's Daily News. And in Santa Cruz, California, is Stephen Zunes. He's a professor of politics and international studies, and coordinator of the Middle East program at the University of San Francisco. Uh, Sarah Korshid, let me start with you. Uh, this, there is this phenomenon of enforced disappearances that has been happening in Egypt for a couple of years now. Uh, I think one human rights group documented around 400 last year, just in the first seven or eight months, not counting people who are known to be dead. Uh, talk to us about what seems to be happening. Uh, there are numerous instances and numerous reports, as you said, well documented by uh, Human Rights uh, Watch and Amnesty International and reported by um, human rights activists in Egypt about the sudden and frequent disappearance of 
sometimes political activists, sometimes journalists, sometimes people who uh, youth who don't have um, history and uh, as political activists, uh, they disappear uh, sometimes for months. Some of them have not shown up for two years now. Um, and then occasionally, uh, after the families would search everywhere, hospitals and police stations, they would finally, uh, usually within months, find them uh, in a police station or a police facility uh, detained. Uh, even though the state and uh, President Sisi and the state-run human rights body um, repeatedly deny the existence of enforced disappearance as a phenomenon in, in Egypt, we do know for sure, certainly, that it exists. Uh, we, we, um, this is something that the Egyptian government is not happy about it getting exposed, but it is happening. We know that when a BBC report was released um, a few weeks ago, um, interviewing the families of victims of enforced disappearances, along with families of, of uh, Egyptians who have been subjected to other human rights abuses and violations, the Egyptian uh, state uh, got furious over that report. Uh, the uh, state-run body uh, issued a strongly worded statement against this report in specific. And one of the uh, mothers uh, who spoke to BBC uh, saying that her daughter was uh, disappeared, she got arrested. And she's now under arrest. Well, uh, well let me let me just hold that for a moment here because I want to bring in Jonathan Moremi. We heard Sarah Korshi talking about this phenomenon of enforced disappearances, but also one thing that has changed uh, in Egypt, Jonathan, is that even in the later years of Mubarak, before he was ousted, there was some space in the press for criticism and dissent. You wrote for the Daily News of Egypt for a long time. Things seem to have changed. Talk to us about what's happening uh, on the media front. Before I do that, Jason, let me just just connect to what Sarah said, because this is a vital point here with the enforced disappearance, just to show you how bad it is and that it doesn't only target political activists. There is a man who was enforced disappeared under the typical uh, irregular uh, conditions of Egypt. His son was enforced disappeared in 2013, has never turned up again. So in 2014, this man started to become an activist, trying to convince the Egyptian government to give him any information about family members who have been enforced disappeared. This man in September 2017 was invited by the United Nations Human Rights Council to speak in Geneva about enforced disappearances in Egypt. And the Egyptian Sisi regime had nothing better to do but to arrest this man on his trying to leave at Cairo airport and enforce disappeared him. So in trying to stifle any discussion about enforced disappearances in Egypt at the United Nations, they enforced disappeared the man who was supposed to speak there, which of course led to the fact that now not only the United Nations Human Rights Council was speaking about enforced disappearances in Egypt, but the whole world was now talking about it. This is the way the security apparatus under Sisi operates. There is no, no rational to all of this. It is much from the gut and it is causing a huge damage. And the enforced disappearances, Sisi always tries to tell us it's just one, one police officer that is perhaps not acting correctly. From all the cases we know, this is not the case. And the regime just doesn't answer to where these people are. With regard to your question, what the press uh, goes on, it has always been problematic to report from Egypt because in Egypt, um, the idea that a foreign uh, uh, press report could shame the nation is very quickly uh, propagated by the regime. But what we see under Sisi is beyond anything we've seen before. It targets any form of critical journalism. Many of the foreign uh, correspondents, including me, had to actually leave Egypt because the pressure was too high, the threats were too big. And now it even targets the, the uh, regime pro-regime journalists in Egypt, as we've seen last Sunday, when a very famous talk show host who's always been pro Sisi was arrested and jailed for four days pending investigation because the day before on his program, he was discussing the complaints by police officers with regard to their wages. Now, even journalists who are pro Sisi are not 
safe anymore in Egypt. And that is surely something we've never seen before. Well, let me bring in Stephen Zunes now for Zunes for a moment now, because I understand, uh, Stephen, there was this law that was passed last year that we heard Michelle Dunn referring to earlier in the program, targeting civil society groups, not just human rights groups or groups maybe that are, um, you know, can be seen as regime dissidents, but women's groups, legal aid groups, things like that. What, what has been the effect uh, of that law? Well, it's been uh, it's been quite dramatic in the sense that um, it's essentially eliminated any outlet uh, for uh, Egyptians to express their concern, not just about the regime, but about uh, many other issues in society that concern them. One of the real exciting developments in Egypt in recent decades was the explosion of civil society organizations. Uh, Everything from uh, you know, trade unions to women's uh, rights uh, to uh, uh, rights of Bedouins and, and, and minor various minorities, uh, as well as the uh, human rights organizations uh, that uh, and student activists, which who, who played such a major role in the downfall of Mubarak. Uh, public opinion polls show a growing number of Egyptians, particularly uh, younger Egyptians, are well educated. Our, uh, our secular and outlook are want a more uh, democratic and pluralistic society. I mean, these are this is the future of Egypt, and the CC regime is quite determined to make sure this uh, this uh, future does not take place. That the that the military will maintain uh, its uh, dominant role at all costs. Well, Sarah Korshi, let me bring you back in as well, because Egypt does have thousands of political prisoners right now. I understand that you have spoken with a number of people, knew a number of people who have been arrested. Can you tell us maybe one of their stories? How does, how does the regime justify these arrests? For example, there is Hisham Ghaffar. Uh, he is a good friend of mine, and, his, uh, and he is... Um, has been a journalist, a member of the press syndicate, and also he ran a civil society organization that aimed at empowering politicians and provi providing capacity building programs for uh, young members of parliament, of the new existing parliament. And um, he got arrested uh, in, his, in the premises of his organization. He has been in um, extrajudicial, or let me say, uh, pre-trial detention until now for, for more than two years. Uh, he is in a very bad medical condition um, and he's not being allowed to, uh, to give in proper medical uh, care in prison. His family is offering to finance his care themselves uh, uh, in, 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 in another private hospital, in any private hospital, but the regime is not allowing for this to happen. Um, I mean, difficult. what does the government use as justification for doing things like this, holding people for two years without trial? Like, for for a case like this, they typically accuse um, accuse activists who work for civil society, accuse them of uh, receiving foreign funding, uh, which is, this is tied to a point mentioned uh, earlier now about uh, Anything that has to do with the outside world, with the foreign uh, foreign funding, foreign media, is uh, is framed as part of an international or of a global grand conspiracy against Egypt, a, a conspiracy that is supposedly meant to bring down the state. This is something that President Sisi himself has repeatedly and very openly spoken about. Although he does receive military aid from the from the U.S. government, and he ha he is in very good terms with the Israeli government. He uh, and uh, media outlets that support him repeatedly speak about uh, a foreign conspiracy by the West and by uh, evil people, uh, quote unquote, as he as he did say uh, repeatedly in his public statements, who want to bring down the state. Well, so, it does. I mean, it does sound like there's a contradiction there if Egypt is reliant so much on foreign aid and especially in the past on foreign tourism, and yet is this is being used as a pretext to attack domestic dissidents. If I add if I may add, please, also a typical pretext is ter terrorism. So, as was mentioned earlier, uh, there are a lot of um, clearly secularist activists who are uh, accused of being terrorists and who are in jail accordingly. Uh, there are a lot of Islamists who, do who are not involved in terror uh, activ activity and don't support violence or terrorism who are also in jail. 
often an extrajudicial uh, detention without a trial or convention unconstitutionally beyond the two-year limit uh, for extra for pretrial detention as per the constitution it has typically gone beyond that and terrorism is a very easy uh, pretext that the regime typically uses in many cases. So it's being used as a catch-all sort of for its critics or people that it just views as being threatening. I do want to just remind our listeners that they're tuned into Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's program, we're talking about the staged presidential elections in Egypt this month, what they mean for stability in a country that has been a key U.S. ally in the Middle East. We're joined by Sarah Korshid, an Egyptian journalist who recently wrote about the elections for foreign policy. Jonathan Moremi, a journalist who's written for the Daily News Egypt, before it was taken over by the government, and Stephen Zunas, a professor and coordinator of the Middle East program at the University of San Francisco. Jonathan Moremi, let me go to you. Uh, why, like, what is the purpose of having this election if it is such a sham? Like, what, what good does it do the government to go through this? One more time, I first connect to what you just said, because I'm glad that you mentioned to the readers, to the to the listeners of this program, that the Daily News Egypt that I used to work for doesn't exist anymore in this form. It has been taken over by the state media, and it is now propagating Sisi's line, and that is how he deals with media. All the media, basically, in Egypt are now in the hands of the national security forces. And the line they always tow is, as Sarah pointed out, there are foreign forces out there who want to destroy Egypt. We have never been able to assess who exactly these forces are, but it is typical for an autocratic system to have a scapegoat and it must always be someone outside of the country to make sure that you inside the country could not possibly be implicated by any wrongdoings. But it goes that far that even newspapers like the Daily News eat Egypt now are just propagating what the government says, and you cannot work for it anymore. Could you reply, uh, repeat your question? Yeah, sorry. Uh, well, actually, let me let me jump that point to Stephen Zunas then as well. I mean, why, Stephen, why do you think, why is the government even going through the motions of having an election? Uh, as we mentioned, the, the, op the opponent seems like sort of a classic patsy uh, that he's not even, he's a supporter of LCC himself. Uh, I, I'm, I don't doubt that he entered the uh, election simply to uh, make it appear like a competitive election. Uh, we can remember how uh, uh, you know, President Bush praised uh, Egypt for finally having a, a competitive election uh, when the uh, opposing uh, a candidate in his campaign was, was so heavily repressed, only got a few percent of the vote, largely because of vote rigging. So often this, uh, these uh, pseudo-elections do uh, uh, get recognized by allied governments like the United States because, after all, we supposedly invaded Iraq to promote democracy, where we, we supposedly support Israel because it's a sole democracy in the Middle East. We, you know, so much of rationalizations for controversial uh, policies in the United States are in the name of democracy. Uh, sometimes uh, e even Washington will uh, take these uh, f uh, phony elections if there's a token competitor uh, as evidence of, of, uh, of reform, of uh, that, that, that the, our allies aren't such bad guys and, 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 and that, that sort of thing. Uh, I, I mean, there, there, let me just throw in that it is, it is uh, qu quite ironic that the government is using this kind of nationalist card uh, that it, it, it you know, claims uh, the, the government to run media has even claimed that the um, uh, April 6th movement, uh, the, the, um, the uh, youth movement that uh, helped lead the uh, uprising, which uh, led to uh, uh, Mubarak's downfall, <clears throat> being uh, both supported by the United States and allies uh, with the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, despite right. the fact that these students are, are in fact quite left-leaning in their sympathies, are very critical <laughs> of the United States and its policies, and are decidedly secular, and uh, did not support the uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, were very active in the uh, campaign against, against Morsi. Uh, so, you know, the, this, this tendency of the, of the regime to uh, play the nationalist card, despite, you know, being very closely allied with, with Western interests and, you know, have this broad brush of any opponent trying to undermine the state and, 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 and to uh, undermine, undermine the nation. I mean, this is the, you know, the typical um, uh, tactics of, uh, of a dictatorship, and I only hope that uh, 
uh, Washington will be a little more uh, critical and willing to challenge this regime than it has in the past. Well, Sarah Korshid, in your piece for foreign policy, you made some excellent points, I think, about how, you know, it does seem like politics is sort of shut down in Egyptian society as a whole, but within the security services, within the military, the police, there it actually seems like there is a lot of drama and things are contested. Talk to us about that. If I, if I may add, please, also uh, to an important point that was addressed by both Stephen and Jonathan uh, regarding the election, how staged it is. I want to say that I, I have, uh, over the years, covered other elections that took place in Egypt, including under Mubarak. And, yeah, always the elections where there was uh, rigging, there was, uh, it was always primarily a show for the international image and for the Western allies and, and aid providers. But there is something very unique about this particular upcoming election is that the, the fact that the, the, the regime uh, is very open, is interestingly and in a funny way very open about how this election is only fake. Like they are not trying to say that this is a real election. The, the, the other contester who is not being taken seriously, as Michelle said, was a supporter uh, of Sisi, was an open supporter of Sisi's candidacy in this election uh, just one day before uh, he was forced to run or he was pressured to run because the, the, the said openly, we want to have somebody run. We want to have the appearance of election. We want to tell the world that there is an election in Egypt. This is something that is openly and repeatedly said in uh, pro-Sisi uh, media outlets. So uh, they are not even trying to And I to think hide. his opponent actually said that he didn't, didn't want to challenge or criticize LCC in any ways, which is, which is hard to do if you're yeah. an opposition candidate. But we, our time does grow short, Sarah. And so if you could just address some of these tensions, we have about 45 seconds left within the military, within the security establishment. What does that mean for the future after this election? The for, simply the former um, uh, chief of staff of the Egyptian army and a member of the uh, high profile uh, military council in Egypt, uh, Sami Anan. He was uh, arrested uh, for, just for uh, arguing that he is, or sorry, just for announcing that he is uh, running in the election against Sisi or that he intends to run. Uh, Observers uh, widely believe that he must have had or must have secured uh, some kind of support from the security apparatuses before announcing that he would run, but, uh, which raises speculations about internal divisions uh, between uh, security apparatuses. But nonetheless, what seems is that uh, Sisi's camp is is currently more powerful and more able to enforce uh, and to impose its will because uh, Adan got arrested by the military and is now detained in a military detention facility. But the fact that he came out, such a high-ranking general, came out and publicly challenged LCC, as some others have as well, is indicative perhaps that things aren't all, uh, that the security services aren't yeah. all on the same page. Definitely. Absolutely. Well, yeah, because I'm, I'm sorry, we're just out of time for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Michelle Dunn, Sarah Korshi, Jonathan Moremi and Stephen Zunis. Our assistant producers this week are Taylor Campbell, Jonathan Mitchell and Blythe Nebaker. Our supervising producer is Lauren Workman. Jiwon Choi is visual editor. Aaron Hay is audio engineer. Travis McMillan is our director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.